All right, well, let's begin. With, I believe we have thousands of people watching this online. So, <laughs> so let's assume that the multitudes are there. So welcome everybody uh, to this IJ for EU masterclass. Uh, it's really nice to see some of you on a Saturday morning. Nice to see the multitudes out there on the internet also watching. Uh, I'm Timothy Large. I'm the uh, director of independent media programs at the International Press Institute. And for the last couple of years, I've had the privilege of leading one of our grand programs, uh, which is called the International the Investment of Journalism in Europe, which is all about supporting cross border collaborative journalism in Europe. Uh, and this session is essentially brought to you by IJ for EU. IJ for EU is now in its fourth year, and uh, every year we, we give out more than a million euros in grants specifically to support cross border collaborations between teams of journalists, whether they're freelancers or newsrooms or combinations of uh, reporting on you know, chunky public interest topics. Uh, with, requiring quite a lot of resources. So the grants are quite large. They can be up to 50,000 euros, for example. They also come with other forms of support, such as uh, legal assistance, editorial practical support, that kind of thing. So that's, that's IJ50U, and I, I take the liberty of giving a bit of a plug because our applications are now open for uh, the latest round of funding. Uh, the, the applications are open until the 13th of December, and all those people listening to this uh, broadcast. I hope you will be working on your applications, and I hope that, in fact, you may receive some practical tips here today on what makes a good cross-border collaborative project. But this is really uh, a, a case studies in collaboration, and uh, we have four really incredible journalists here to share some of their, their insights and knowledge on what it takes to put together uh, a cross-border collaborative project. And because this is a, a masterclass, we want to get really kind of nitty gritty and not shy away from uh, you know all the the nuts and bolts and the things that can go wrong and the things that can go very right, all that kind of stuff. Let's see if we can extract some lessons that others might be able to learn from. So that that's the general idea behind it. Um, let me introduce you to our speakers, and then we'll, we'll get on with it. So we have Roman Annan, who need, needs no introduction, I think. He's the editor and founder or co-founder of iStories, or Important Stories, uh, a Russian investigative news outlet which operates in exile, um, based in Latvia, I believe. Uh, kind of. Kind of, in <laughs> transition, maybe. <laughs> uh, so great to have you here, Roman. We also have Anna Babinitz, who also needs no introduction. She's a Ukraine editor for OCCRP, among other things. We're also the founder of a very incredible investigative news outlet. And last night, the winner of the uh, press. Congratulations, Anna. Great to have you here. Natalia Antalava is also a name who will be familiar to many, I'm sure. She's the co founder of the Coda Story based in Tbilisi, but Coda Story is actually based in, in States, I believe, uh, and a veteran journalist uh, of many years, done an extraordinary number of things, including many collaborative cross-border projects. So thank you so much for joining Natalia. I should also mention, in the interest of full disclosure, Natalia last year uh, was a jury member on the, uh, the independent jury that selects projects for ij funding. Uh, we have a, a, a very rigorous system of um, ensuring independence between the donor. Most of the money for ij for u comes from the European Commission, as well as some philanthropies. And IPI and our partners work as uh, an independent intermediary to disperse that money to the best projects. And those projects are chosen by an independent jury. So the donors have no say whatsoever in it. This ensures editorial independence. So thank you for your service last year on that, Natalia. And finally, we have Otavia. Uh, Otavia is a freelance journalist, a journalist uh, based in New York, so you're from Italy. Yeah. Uh, specialist in long-form journalism, done some really incredible stuff for all sorts of publications, including the New Yorker and Guardian and so forth, and IJ for EU grantee twice. Twice. Yeah. <laughs> so she's got some insights into this process. 
Uh, so it's great to have you here. Thank you. And I think we might start with you, uh, if that's all right, Pamela, yeah, because she has a, a presentation, and then we'll just have a, a more of a general. Okay. Talk. I hope the presentation is not too long. Um, I am going to try to not make it too boring. Okay. Use that. Okay. Oh no! Actually, let me check. We are now sharing this. Yes. All you have to do is. Yes. Um, you can hear me okay, right? I hope so. Um, okay. Well, if you want, if it feels better, you can have a microphone that actually amplifies. They're the same. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay, well, thank you so much for being here with so many amazing um, journalists. Um, I, um, as Tim said, I was part of two teams that actually um, got the uh, IJ4U grants for two years. And the first investigation that I worked on with my um, co-writers was an investigation into the European anti-vax um, movement. And the second one was very different, and it was an, organi uh, an investigation into the inequalities of the European criminal justice system and how those inequalities prevent asylum seekers and migrants from having fair trials and uh, a fair defense in Europe. And I'm going to start uh, with the photo uh, of a wolf because I am a freelance journalist and I know that for many, many years, we've been sold the mythology of the lone wolf, like the, the investigative journalist as the lone wolf. But I know that, uh, and as you know, uh, it's getting increasingly unsustainable. Um, some stories, like the stories that I've worked on for the IJ4U sto um, pro program, um, are simply not uh, possible uh, to be carried out just by one lone wolf and uh so you need other people you need other journalists and also as a um an independent journalist i know that uh as you probably do know as well that when you do investigative work you encounter a number of challenges uh, of challenges and roadblocks and having access to other peers is incredibly um, helpful and it's crucial very very often and what happens is that this is a photo of a very sad wolf because this is a wolf that doesn't have ears uh it's a lonely wolf so uh this is me without uh, my peers uh, i'm actually kidding i also do um independent work by myself but i do think that when you work as a freelancer it's so important to actually create a community um to have peers and what these kind of programs do uh, for freelancers because i know i talk to a lot to many many freelancers here in the us and in europe as well it's really giving you a sense of not being alone and of um being able to kind of like um tap into the support of a community and almost uh, as a you know like a virtual newsroom um now i'm going to try to be as hands-on as possible because I know that for if freelancers are um, uh, listening to us, but also media organizations, uh, there's a new application, uh, IJ4U application coming up. Um, and the application is made up of three main uh, parts, the elements. Uh, there's the story, there's the partners, and there's the media partners and publications. And so these things might look very um, banal, uh, but once you start writing an application, they are actually incredibly important, and so they cannot be taken for granted. So, of course, this story has to be to have a clear question and a clear and clear possible findings. And I'm gonna uh, get back to this because uh, in one of my case studies, um, it has to be compelling to you and to others, of course, but especially I think to you because you're going to spend months working on that story it has to be accessible of course the uh the resource like uh, the sources have to be accessible to you and it has to be of course within budget and then you have to find partners especially if you um are a freelancer you need to find other journalists sometimes they can be staff writers or sometimes can, they can be independent journalists 
And I always suggest you kind of like start, um, try to find someone whose work you really admire, um, someone who's passionate about the project as you are and someone you trust. Um, it's not always easy to find someone you trust. Uh, so what I usually uh, suggest is to look at the body of work of that person. If that person has worked with others, it's usually a sense, like a sign that that person is able, of course, to work with others. And, and so that person might actually be a good partner for you. And then the trickiest part for me, and I'm going to get back to you, and for many, many freelancers out there, is always finding a media partner. So someone who's actually going to publish your story. For this application, um, I, I think you need, in order to apply, you need letters of intent, which are great because they, they help you get in touch with your um, po potential media publications, right? But those, those are only letters of intent. So it doesn't mean that the media partners are actually going to publish your work for sure. So you know, that can be tricky, and I'm going to tell you why. The first story that um, we worked on actually stemmed from a story that I had written uh, at the beginning of the pandemic on the European, uh, the Italian um, anti-vaccination movement. Uh, it was a short story that I had written for um, Slate, and I had done many more interviews than I actually needed for that particular story. But I had created, um, in doing so, I had created uh, sources within the anti-vax movement in Italy. And I had a clear sense that the pandemic was really galvanizing the movement and that some people were actually starting to capitalize on it to get, um, to kind of like use the movement for financial gains and political gains as well. Um, so what I did, I got together with two other journalists, um, Sarah Hertz, who's a French journalist, and um, Isabel Thompson, who's a British journalist, and we set up to really map out how the movement worked in Europe. We wanted to figure out who the leaders of the movement were, and where they were operating, and why, what were their motives. So we applied for a grant, we got the grant, and we started working on that project. Um, we spent months, like, so nearly a year working on that project. Um, and we did a lot of stuff. Uh, we, did, we started off um, by doing a lot of social media forensics. We filed uh, dozens of FOIA requests, and I'll tell you why in a, in a second court filings, um, we went through court filings, uh, financial records of organizations and companies. We went through academic papers. We even had access to internal emails of some of the main anti-vax groups in Europe. And then we conducted tons of interviews all over Europe. And we were really excited about what we found because what we actually found was that the way the anti-vax movement works in Europe is not just a network, but it's actually a really well-oiled machine. So we found that there are a network of a web, actually, of lawyers and doctors uh, and influencers um, that uh, actually um, kind of spread this information, this information on vaccines for their personal, professional, um, financial gains. And sometimes they manage to do so because uh, thanks to the like governments in action um, or thanks to loopholes in the law. So it's a very complex uh, subject, but a, a good example is what happened, uh, what has been happening in Italy. So for years, uh, anti-vax doctors were used by lawyers in compensation um, suits in Italian courts. And what happened was that these lawyers used anti-vax doctors as technical experts in courts to have the doctors testify that there was a non-existent, an existent 
um, nexus between vaccines and autism, which we all know it doesn't exist, right? But these doctors actually testified that there was an ex a nexus. And as a result of, of, of those testimonies, a number of families of children with autism in Italy got um, compensation for vaccine injuries. So we found, you know, worked really hard, found all these findings, very exciting. Um, and then we actually had to publish the piece. We wrote the piece, um, several drafts, and we wanted to publish it which is the main goal of a journalist, right? Um, publishing this piece was incredibly hard. So I think that first of all, we made one mistake, um, which was because it was a, such a complex piece. Remember at, at first I was telling you, find a story with a very simple question. We didn't have a simple question. We had this very ambitious project of really mapping out how the movement works. And so what happened was that it took us weeks and weeks before we actually had findings that we could present to an editor. What happened afterwards, um, one, like an editor from a, a very big uh, media organization was really interested in the piece, but very busy, sat on the piece for many, many weeks. We were hoping to get this piece, this piece published with this organization. Um, we wrote the piece in the meantime because we wanted to kind of like get ahead and not, you know, waste time. And the editor just goes to that as at some point, which happens a lot if you're a freelancer. And so after that, um, we really struggled to have the piece published in English. We haven't published it in English yet, but the piece came out into Dutch um, media and did really, really well. It went, uh, it broke all the records on this a Dutch uh, media website, a uh, Mo magazine. Um, and the editor was extremely excited, went viral twice, but the piece has not been published in English yet. So it's great, but at, at the same time, it's like, wow, this is a big, big struggle. Um, so we learned our big lesson. Um, if you're a team of freelancers, pitch as soon as possible and make sure that your editor is on board from the start like get the editor's attention and make him or her committed to the piece and to the story and this is what we've done with the second story which actually stemmed out of that community that I was telling you about because my co one of my co-writers that worked on the anti-vax uh, piece with me um, Isabel Thompson, she also worked on a second investigation uh, uh, that was actually supported by ij for You. Um, and uh, this, this second investigation came from, while well, Isabel and I were working on the anti-vax piece, uh, both of us had covered migration issues in Europe, and we had both noticed two trends. Uh, one, uh, increasing number of asylum seekers and migrants in Europe were being prosecuted as smugglers just because they were at the helm of a boat that was crossing, uh, making the crossing from uh, North Africa, mainly Libya to um, Italy. The same thing was actually happening in Greece and in uh, the UK as well. Um, and so that was the first trend. The second trend was that we had realized that a lot of people who didn't speak the language, the local language in Italy, but also in the UK, um, did not have access to translators. And so we began looking into this and we got together. Uh, we realized very soon that we actually needed someone in Greece, someone who was a great journalist and who could speak uh, in Greece because there, there were three angles to the story. There was Italy, the UK, but also Greece. And we started looking for someone in Greece. And the person that we found, like going back to this, like to the network, was actually um, someone that was my competitor in an award. Uh, we were both shortlisted. Uh, her name is Ileana Papangeli. We were both shortlisted for the European Press Prize last year. I loved her work. 
And so we reached out and we were like, we have this project, do you want to jump on? And she was like, yeah, sure. So we got together, applied for, a, for another plant from the IJ for you and uh, did this investigation. And what we found was incredible. Like, I mean, I mean it's just mind blowing. So thousands and thousands of people have been arrested as smugglers in our countries. But the even more um, kind of like haunting thing is that very few of them were actually granted a fair trial and a fair defense. Most of them did not have um, translators uh, went, like went after they were arrested. They could not communicate with their lawyers. Um, many of them didn't even know why they were being accused. And the majority of them actually ended up in pretrial detention and spent years in prison for a crime that no, most of the time they did not commit. So, um, yeah. So the the investigation has was published last week uh, in English. Thank goodness, we are very excited about that because more people can read it. But uh, it was also published by Domani, which is one of the main newspapers uh, in Italy, daily newspapers, and it's going to be published in Greek as well. And I'm going to wrap up because uh, I've taken so much of your time. But I think that like my um, main takeaway is we have never really had problems uh, collaborating like in the two teams. And I think that the key to that was a very clear communication, which we think, I think, but my colleagues, I think they agree to a good organization. So have a shared, a shared agenda for each meeting, follow up email after every meeting. So everybody knows what to do. Very simple, but sometimes, you know, like we are overwhelmed and we don't do it. And that creates problems. Sharing, like share, like share the reporting process. And I'm gonna share just a couple of um, tools that we used. And then this is so important. And people who have never worked on collaborations, uh, I think they are not used to that. But one's info is everybody's info. Like it's the team's info. It's not just the lone wolf does not exist. It's the team, it's the pack. And, and then like being flexible. <laughs> so this is very um, kind of like banal again, but some people are not used to being edited and some people are not used to um, working with others. And so everything you write is gonna be changed or edited. And that's great because the, the goal is to make it better. Um, again, like where do you find partners? Um, if you don't know, Hostwriter is a great community. It's an online community. It's great. Journalism conferences like this one, great. Um, friends of friends, colleagues of colleagues, and also works so like people you admire and sometimes they're co your competitors and you know, like they can be your allies. Um, these are a couple of tools that we used. Uh, we called this the grid. So each of us for each country kind of like had um, a, a grid, like a, an Excel sheet where we had all our sources, um, you know, like divided by legal, civil society, academic, uh, the concrete cases. The, in, in this case, we wanted to kind of map out also the obstacles to defense and then other findings so that everybody could kind of like understand what the other, um, what the other were uh, doing and what their findings were. And then we used uh, Trezorit, which is an end-to-end -end encrypted um, uh, kind of like uh, storage uh, to storage all our work. And if you look at it, it's really important to keep all the material um, kind of like keep keep it organized uh, because there's so much material and yeah, and that's it. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Otavia. It's great to see the process behind these incredible stories. Are there any questions for Otavia before we move on? We can always come back to them later as well. But I mean, no? Okay, and what was the name of that? Uh, secure storage. It's called Trezorit. 
treasure it. Treasure it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It. It's a little bit costly, but uh, not too expensive, and it's it's safe and secure. So yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. But why don't we go to Anna next? Um, because I understand you may want to share the screen a little bit or share some, some websites. 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 So here is the microphone. Let's make sure we've got the uh, websites on. So I guess oh, great. hopefully everybody can see that. Mm -hmm. right. okay. Over to you, Anna. Um, hello, everyone. <laughs> Um, yeah, it was actually a very interesting presentation because your work is freelancer and uh, it's very complicated, I think, for you to find partners for all the stories. I um, I will talk mostly about co cooperation between uh, centers because I'm representing here Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting pro uh, Project. This is a network of investigative centers around the world. And also, I'm a editor in chief of Svetstvo Info, it's Ukrainian investigative media. Uh, so, uh, when we're looking for partners, we are just opening the map of our partner centers. Uh, it's almost in every country, and we know that there are um, the same quality, the same level of quality of journalism we produce our partners in every country produce or if we um, looking for some specific journalists, we ask partners in Serbia, in Georgia, in uh, United States, we looking through our network. So it's easier for us to find partners. But uh, for my experience, it's like three types of collaboration, like general types of collaboration between organizations. Uh, I mean, international cross boarding uh, stories. Uh, one of them is like big, huge projects like Panama Papers, Paradise Papers, and it's usually it's very well organized by people who organize all these platforms and uh, rules of work and uh, deadlines, timelines, and everything works great. I I even can't imagine how how much work people uh, uh, people spent for that. So, for example, Panama Papers. It was six years ago. It was almost four hundred journalists, and they had to keep secret about this project. And I can't imagine how how hard was that work. And but for me, it was really good experience, and it was really good uh, case to learn how so huge collaboration possible and so big and important product uh, we might uh, get in the end. So like one type of collaboration, cross-border collaboration, and actually it's good uh, uh, examples and it's a good chance to find partners for future stories if you have like not, not so big and so global stories. Uh, another type is uh, collaboration between countries, and actually we we also applied for for this uh, for this grant, and with our partners from Romania and Bulgaria, we got some grant, but we're still ongoing story. It's about uh, okay. I hope you will publish. You will see. I will not tell. Um, but usually, uh, when we found some good stories, and uh, in Ukraine, for example. We ask our colleagues from Bulgaria, from Romania, let's do something together and then apply, apply for this grant. And it's really great possibility for uh, partner or CRP partner center to do something like between two or three centers. And we, we did that. I would like to show um, as example of collaboration we did with our Serbian colleagues. Uh, So it was a really um, crazy story. We obtained this in uh, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, this uh, it was a story about uh, uh, one of leader of uh, Balkanian uh, drug. Uh, he was like leader of like drug dealers, the head of some big clan, uh, and he came to Ukraine. I don't know for, for what. Uh, and when he came in a couple months, uh, four killers from Montenegro came to Ukraine and uh, uh, tried to kill him. And this is a picture of his wife who um, saved him. She, she started to shoot on the killers and they ran away. 
yeah and it's really from the beginning it was crazy story yeah so and we obtained that video i got from my sources from police uh, uh video and pictures and then four killers it was really it's absolutely crazy story i don't want to, to put a lot of details but it's like a hollywood story uh because there are two uh, killers who came to kill uh, kill him they used like smart car this is a small yeah. car for two persons and then in the end it's burned we have a video and they just run away <laughs> it was you know it's like in, in uh, uh, funny and bad hollywood movies but thanks to this woman his wife um, he sort of survived that uh, uh, the killer uh and then that four that four killers run away from uh, ukraine and uh, almost next to the border they were stopped by police and this is the picture um they arrested them and uh, my sources in police gave me pictures of documents of all of the killers and then we figure out in Ukraine, it's crazy story but it's not our story it's like story of some killers from balkan we have really great uh, um, partners in uh, Serbia, Krik. I, I, I think maybe you know this. Uh, you know them, and uh, we told them that we have documents about the killers. They are from Montenegro, from Serbia. We don't know, and we don't know if it's our story, if it's not our story. And we knew that this partner center will do really, really great work. And then we talked to them and they found all the people and they say, guys, this is the uh, story about drug dealers. We were working for years about them. Uh, and then uh, really um, great, interesting <laughs> and un uh, unpredictable uh, story started uh, because then we sent a gift to kill them. Yeah. Wow. They sent a gift to kill, to kill them. And what we found out and when we figure out that it's Ukrainian and Serbian stories, we just thought that uh, uh, that killers from uh, Balkan uh, they used Ukrainian, Ukraine, Kiev, just for their own business, their own stuff. But then we figure out when we uh, was together with these four killers, it was two cars. It was arrested about seven or eight people, and I got uh, the documents of all the people who accompanied them, and uh, one of them was. Uh, uh person from ukrainian police and then we figure out that ukrainian police people officials help that people to come to ukraine illegally and to leave ukraine illegally and they accompanied them in the process of it was ukrainian part of story uh and then uh, serbian when, when serbs start to work on that they figure out that partly the killers from one group uh i don't know how to explain that it's really really uh, this is red um this is a guy and it's two clans two big drug clans who fight to each other and uh, uh when uh, our serbian journalist worked in serbia they found uh, police uh, showed them or they found um uh, that one of group group which was fighting with this red Witzer who was in kiev uh they killed their uh enemies and they um, how do you call this stuff with uh when you're doing meatballs from meat it's like special equipment uh, like this um, stuff for meat grinder. Meat grinder, yeah so yeah, they used like uh, industrial meat grinder for uh, yes and they found yeah, once when they killed their enemies Holy and they hold for they used that and then they did chavapi. They took like, chavapi from from their enemies and sent to what? Have you got a Netflix deal? <laughs> no, actually, we produced our story. We produced uh this is this. yeah, I think that everything for, for Netflix. Um <laughs> yeah. We produced our studies and then we figure out so many stuff and Krik, uh, the, uh, the agency in, in uh, Serbia, they produced uh, like an um, article, but every step it was like, I was like this editor, I was sitting when my journalist came to me, I told them, no guy, it can't be so worse. And every step was, was worse and worse and worse. And uh, we produced, actually we produced video. And we came to our well, four killers. It calls. It's with, uh, with uh, actually subtitles. Uh, you you can watch in English. 
So we. Yeah, maybe I will show you the the Smith Raider. <laughs> it was already in the end. Yeah, this is the. So our journalists, my Ukrainian journalists, they came to Serbia and they recorded uh, that uh, Serbian journalists, our colleagues, we started to cooperate like partners, but then we figure out that they uh, know this background of this mafia fights very, very good. And they are good for narrative for our story to explain because for Ukraine, it's just random stuff. You never, we worked on that only because we use it police, Ukrainian police connected to that. So we started like, first we started with, can you please help these passports? And we finished with uh, coming to Serbia and uh, yeah, this is the place where they killed. Uh, so this is, I mean, if you have like uh, time and interested, you can watch this story. I think that Netflix or Hollywood should be interested on it. Uh, but uh, this is like the story about cooperation. We use it that people that we can trust them. They very good with uh, uh, with searching, but then we found out that they so great that we want to uh, we want to shoot them, and we came, and they are. And they, in the end, part of our story, the journalist who worked, the journalist who found, found that. And actually, it was really good cooperation. And they published story in Ukrainian and Serbian. And this is a story for OCCRP we published. And uh, what actually happened to this uh, uh, Radoj Svitsev, he just disappeared in the end. I think that the Ukrainian police helped him to do that. Um, and uh, there is the guy, Yevgen Day Day. Uh, this guy is like, uh, he's one of important guy in Ukrainian police. He had a position at the moment when it happened. And we knew and we proved that he was in cars with killers. He helped uh, them to, he helped them to come to Ukraine illegal without uh, order. Uh, and my journalist tried to talk to him. He, of course, he said that no, 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 nothing happened. Uh, he's a really crazy guy. I don't know how he was, like, how he had so big position in police at that time. And uh, this uh, winter, um, his wife informs that he was killed. But now we know that from our sources, that, that guy somewhere in Europe is fake. <laughs> the story is still continuing. Yeah, we just figure out in what country he is, and we will apply for another for another story because where this guy appears, it's always like some crazy stuff uh -huh. going on. Yeah, this is like a good example for me, an interesting example of cooperation because we knew about these journalists and we didn't apply for any grants, so we just produced it for our uh, for our centers and for OCCRP, but it was. In the beginning, we just asked them to check passports and then we were so not only our colleagues, they are great, they're experts in this case. I think they are the best experts in mafia uh, details. Yeah, and um, in a very short, I will show another OCRP story we just published. It's another type of um, collaboration. We just published, it's already a war story uh, about Bucha. It's special project. Yeah, this is amazing. Mm. Yeah, we were working on it for for a few months. Um, yeah, that's mostly not about not about cooperation, like between partner between partner journalists, journalists like partners. Um, as it was in April when Bucha, I think everyone knows Bucha. It's it, it's town next to Kiev. It was really Russians when they occupied it for one month. It was really hard. Things happened there. They just killed people. They raped. They tortured people, and a lot of hard stuff happened there. Uh, and one day on Facebook, I found a guy who published um, like pieces messages from uh, like uh, building chat um people you know who live in one building they have like common chat and they talk to each other about parking who parked next to my place or all you know this like domestic stuff but when the war started the chat 
became like place where people inform each other about killing neighbors, about looking for animals, about, you know, it's became for one month, like a terrible, terrible reality show. And we obtained this chat, we asked people to share it with us. Uh, but in the beginning, I saw that it's, I thought that it might be like good video story. But then you know, we talked to um, CRP people and uh, uh, it was really very important for us to have like international view on our story. When you are in the war and you have a lot of, uh, you work with a lot of tragic stories and hard stories and sometimes you can't feel how much context uh, we need to explain, we need to tell. And in these cases and cases in like circumstances, we are now in Ukraine as journalists, it's very nice to have great colleagues who can take a look and uh, uh, like, like look at the situation with different optics and to help to make the story great. I, when I found that, that um, chat, I didn't imagine that it will be a story like that. I think OCCRP first time created that kind of story. It's like multimedia story. This is when you watch, this is just like uh, some of them. It's um, uh, it's messages from that the chat. And then our journalist went to Bucha and talked to the people. It was already two months after occupation. And they talked to people uh who were there so we show where is the block and the problem with the biggest problem with this uh, uh building was because it was in front of uh, the plant old plant where uh russians uh, became russian soldiers became there and they based there and they just killed people who appeared close uh yeah so we found all these people we the building and we talk to people it's mostly not investigation that's like feature but it's very important as this is a video from cctv cameras my journalist obtained this is how russian tanks came to uh to bucha to this small city it's first day before occupation so it's like um, pictures videos it's next to it's close to to that uh, to that building uh we were talking about the messages, pictures, videos, maps, uh, and this what happened with, uh, with this building. A couple of people were killed there. Is that uh, floors? Yeah, so this is like, uh, you can read this as well. And it's not, uh, it's not, uh, not uh, stuff we usually produce. It's a little bit different, but um, it's another type of cooperation. Then you have idea and you have very good uh, uh, circle of great professionals who can make your idea uh, uh, much better than you have. And to tell, especially to tell the story to the world. There are a lot of stories about the war, uh, which like all journalists around the world, right? It's very important to find this focus, to find this kind of optics. And this is different type of collaboration, but idea was from Ukraine. Uh, it was three reporters from Ukraine who worked on that. So one photographer, and it was about five people from United States, from, uh, I think uh, Great Britain from like three or four different countries who helped us and who really made great story, great story for I even didn't imagine that might be so good. So it's kind of collaboration. So and three of them, three collaboration I mentioned, like when you part of big huge uh, a project, when you part, when you just have like two or three partners like equal partners and doing the story and sometimes you don't know what how it will look in the end and when you have idea and you have good circle people from different countries and they can make it much much better and much more interesting different types but all of them really uh, bring great results of work and uh, if you want uh, partners looking for partners, just open OCCRP website and uh, uh, OCCRP investigative center around the world. It's usually people who produce good investigative journalism and you can try to find people there if, if you didn't know about this possibility. Okay, thank you. Fascinating. Any questions for Anna before we move on? We have about 20 minutes left. All right. I'm sorry. No, thank you so much. That was really fascinating. And we look forward to the Netflix series. Yeah, <laughs> Definitely. Uh, why don't we go to, to Roman next, if that's all right. Um, 
in a way, everything you do is by definition cross-border, I suppose you could say. Um, maybe could you just, for those who don't know, give a very brief um, overview of, of what iStories is and then uh, discuss anything you'd like to. Uh, yeah, I'll try to be, um, not to take much of your time. Uh, so iStories is the media, but I mean, it used to be an investigative media outlet, uh, which I founded two years ago. Um, after finishing my fellowship at Stanford University. And uh, I mean, in the beginning, we were thinking about ourselves not as a media, but kind of as a group of journalists who constantly cooperate with our colleagues from all parts of the world, and we publish our stories in the big media. Uh, but, you know, uh, I mean, for some reasons, Russian authorities didn't uh, give us a chance to remain this uh, kind of small um, investigative media. And uh, since the Russian state was going after us, you know, day by day, we had to uh, kind of change the model. And um, uh, especially when the war started, we realized that, you know, our model as an investigative media that published something, uh, publishes something once a week is not working anymore. And we, these days, we are more like a daily media. Uh, sometimes we publish news, but we try to investigate, uh, to, to, to publish really you know, quick investigative stories. I mean, sometimes they take months, like, you know, the story that uh, Muratov mentioned uh, in the first day about the Russian soldier who confessed to uh, the war crimes. We were probably the first uh, media in the world that was able to kind of get um, this, uh, you know, this confession from the soldier himself. Uh, so these days we mainly write stories about the atrocities of the Russian army in Ukraine and also about, um, hidden assets of Russian oligarchs and officials uh, worldwide. Like recently, we published a database with more than 100 uh, properties all over the world, including some here in the US, of uh, sanctioned Russian officials who support the war. And we kind of showed how these people avoid sanctions by just uh, you know, registering assets in the names of their uh, relatives, kids, wives, uh, uncles and uh, many others, and sometimes even nominees. And of course, all these stories wouldn't be possible without help from our colleagues. Uh, like the story that we published, like the database, you know, we used help of our colleagues from Italy, from uh, the US, from many, many uh, countries. And uh, this is where I actually wanted to, uh, to jump and uh, to jump to an example. Uh, of how I became a kind of cult reporter that uh, works on the, that works cross border, because I was this type of lonely uh, wolf, uh, and I always believed that investigative reporters have to uh, work uh, in loneliness uh, because of all the risks that uh, are involved. And you know, why would you invite somebody to an investigation that is so dangerous? You know, you gotta uh, deal with the risks yourself. Uh, that was my idea. Before I met people from OCCRP and ICIJ, um, and before I realized that the real power of journalism is not in competition, but in co collaboration. Um, and uh, of course, I mean, I can talk about Panama Papers, Pandora Papers, you know, uh, all the major cross-border projects that I've been involved uh, that actually proved uh, this power of collaboration. But I'd love to talk about a project that is personally important for me and project that, you know, kind of was a start for me of uh, uh, this collaborative type of uh, reporting. And I mean, Sergei Magnitsky, sorry. Uh, have, uh, does anybody, does everyone know who is Sergei Magnitsky and what is, what is the case? So that I skip the, I think, I think, I think everybody knows. Everybody okay. right I mean, you know, it was the start of the tensions, the real tensions between Russia and the US because Sergei Magnitsky was the lawyer who uncovered one of the most uh, one of the biggest uh, tax uh, crimes in Russia. Uh, actually, he proved that Russian authorities, uh, Russian secret services, and uh, organized crime figures they stole uh, 230 million US dollars from the Russian budget, and he was arrested by the very same officers he had accused of committing the crime, and he was then beaten and died in prison. And his colleagues started a global justice campaign. Uh, trying to find assets of those officials and uh, organized crime figures. So for me, the story started from, I was by that time, this kind of lonely wolf reporter with lots of sources and connections within Russian secret services, police and so on. And, uh, you know, I just 
was publishing some stories about the Magnitsky case, proving that it was not only one example, that, the, that there were many other uh, similar crimes committed by the same group of people, by the same organized crime uh, group and by the same secret service officers. But of course, uh, in the very beginning, I realized that my resources are limited by the borders of Russia, because for instance, what we saw in the criminal case was that only on the territory of Russia, uh, money launderers and criminals um, made more than 10,000 transactions in order to launder the proceeds. Uh, but then we saw that the money was you know, going to Cyprus, to Moldova, to Lithuania, Latvia, uh, Switzerland, and like dozens of countries. And what, you know, what do you do when you see that, you know, if you want to find the end beneficiary of the money, but you see, but you see that the money you know, is not actually staying in Russia, it's going to many other countries. So I decided, you know, just for luck, you know, I wasn't hoping that I would get anything. Uh, I got in touch with my colleague, an amazing reporter from Romania, Mihai Montano, because I knew that he had a lot of contacts in Moldova. And I saw that there were two really big flows of transactions to Moldova, like dozens of millions of dollars. And, you know, as you probably know, in the work of investigative reporters, especially those who write about corruption, the golden document is the banking transaction, uh, the banking data, because it shows you uh, the money flow, right? And our job is to follow the money. And I got in touch with him and asked the question that, I mean, I thought it was like really incredible. It was really impossible. Uh, but I was so, I don't know, I, was, I realized I like, you know, let me ask him, what if, what if uh, we get something? Ask him, hey, man, can you, is it possible to get banking statements of two companies uh, you know, from Moldova? Because uh, I see that, you know, they got money from Russia, but I don't know uh, what happened to uh, this money next. And he said, well, let's, let's, let's see. And in two months, he comes back to me with uh, two Excel files, uh, with, uh, you know, banking, uh, with two banking statements of these companies, which was for me, like, insane, you know, how can... I still don't know how he did it and I don't want to do it. <laughs> Maybe I even don't want to know it, uh, but he got it. Uh, and for us, it was like, you know, opening the second front because we realized, okay, now we see what happened to money next. And we started our investigation. But of course, we saw that from Moldova, the money went to other countries, Latvia, Lithuania, Finland, uh, Cyprus. And that was the time when we, realize what if we do the same that we had done with Mihai with other countries. So let us talk to reporters from Latvia, Lithuania, Finland, and many others. Um, then in the end, we saw that the money actually ended up here in the US, in Manhattan, where uh, son of ex-minister of transportation of Russia, uh, Denis Katsev, uh, bought uh, some luxurious apartments here in Manhattan using the money stolen from the Russian budget. Uh, and the reason we learned it was because at one point we decided to cooperate with a friend of mine, Bill Alpert from, um, from the Barron's uh, magazine, uh, and he was able to find these properties, you know. So in the end, it was like a collaboration of dozens of reporters from dozens of countries. But here, uh, something, there was one also important step that we did. Uh, which is really interesting in terms of ethics and in terms of um, in terms of uh, whether you know there are people are constantly arguing about activism and journalism. What is activism? What is what is journalism? Whether we have right to do some part type of activism. And in my point of view, it's not our job, but we can share some results of our stories, some findings with uh, those activists that we trust, so that they can use those uh, findings in their campaigns. Uh, and of course we were, I mean, cooperating uh, in, uh, of course we use them as a source, but simultaneously, uh, you know, we're cooperating with uh, friends of Sergei Magnitsky. Um, I mean, when I say cooperating, it doesn't mean that we were sharing our data with them. No, I say that, you know, I was kind of, we were honest with them and we said that, look, we can't share the data with you, but of course, once we publish the story, you can use stories for your, campaign, you know, for uh, your lawsuits, which they did. Uh, they filled like dozens of lawsuits in many countries. And uh, I think that uh, right after we published the story, there were six or seven criminal cases studied all over the world uh, in the countries that I mentioned. In, and there was a civil forfeiture case studied here in the US, which ended up with um, uh, with, uh, with a big fine that uh, the son of the minister had to pay, I think about $6 million. Um, and for me, 
when we published this story, when I saw the outcome of the story, it was so great because, you know, it, uh, in Russia and in many other countries, not only in Russia, investigative reporters, they face kind of the same problems. First of all, uh, we lack impact because, you know, in countries like Russia where there is no rule of law, whatever you publish, nothing happens because authorities, they don't give a shit, sorry, you know, about uh, our investigations. And uh, in many cases, even the audience, I mean, even people are so used to corruption that they, you know, they are not surprised. Mm -hmm. But collaboration bring, gives you impact because if nothing happens in Russia, you still can bring justice to uh, uh, the victims in other countries, which, the, which you know, the, the Sergei, Sergei Magnitsky case is, is one of the best examples. Yes, these guys who stole, pardon? Yeah, the guys who stole the money from the budget thought that they are untouchables and nothing would happen to them in Russia. But the assets were frozen in all the countries, in Switzerland, in Cyprus, everywhere. Uh, now they can't fly anywhere. And I'm, you know, when I was in Russia, I met with them. I met with these organized crime guys. I talked to them and I know that it was, a, and it's still a big, big problem for them. They lost millions and millions of dollars. They can't spend their time in, uh, in France, you know, and uh, in other countries. And it's, it's a big problem for them. You know, they, they don't like it. So even, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, they are not in jail, but, you know, uh, at least something. So impact, impact is really important and we can achieve impact, impact with collaboration. Access to data, you know, without collaboration, how would I get data from Moldova? How would I get data from the ES? You know, my story would have just ended in, a, in Russia, you know, I, I would, the, my story would, would end with, uh, I don't know, two sentences where I would have written probably that the money went out of Russia and I have no idea what happened to it afterwards. Uh, but thanks to collaboration, you know, we, our stories become better uh, and we get access to amazing data. And the third uh, conclusion is safety. You know, in many parts of the world, it's lonely, I mean, lonely reporters are, uh, are really those who uh, risk and not because they are so cool, but because they are stupid, sorry. You know, you, I hate those cold boy reporters who say that we don't, we're not afraid of anything. You know, we don't need partners. We will work ourselves. I don't work with such people because I know that they risk their life and they risk the lives of their colleagues for nothing. So cooperation increases your safety because I, you know, when I met, uh, for instance, those uh, organized crime group, uh, organized crime leaders involved in Magnitsky case, I saw that they not only respect me, but they also understand that I'm not alone and that, you know, it's kind of useless to kill me. It's useless to, uh, to do anything with me because they know that the story will still be published. And killing a person, especially a reporter, I mean, it's still, you know, it, it's a complicated thing. It, uh, it's a risky thing because you never, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a step. And, you, and since these guys are very pragmatic, they're kind of thinking whether it's worth doing it. Whether uh, the risk is, you know, whether they really want to kill me. I mean, what's what's the point if still the story will be published and uh, uh, many other reporters are involved in the case? So safety is also a key issue, uh, and it helps a lot uh, when you collaborate. It's not only in Russia; it's everywhere in Venezuela, in Mexico, in many other uh, countries. So these three um, kind of key points, uh, you know proved that uh, I realized uh, more than 10 years ago that, wow, you know, this is the power of collaboration. And um, as, you know, Timothy said, yes, on this stage, almost all the stories that we do, I mean, investigative big stories are collaborative, you know, even the biggest scoops. But sometimes you might think, why do you want to share your story with uh, Der Spiegel, for instance, who recently published a story about the travels of uh, Putin's uh, daughter, and how she used assets of state-owned company and bodyguards when she traveled all, all, over, all around the world. This is my story. This is the story that I found. And, you know, some, someone would think, well, if I had published it in only in nice stories, we would have uh, got more hits and more, um, I don't know, more readership. Uh, but, you know, I knew that it's, it's, it's stupid uh, to, uh, and it's better to share the story with, uh, with partners. And uh, in the end, the story was um, read and, uh, you know, it was published everywhere from India to, to the US. And uh, now we try to cooperate all the time. Sorry, uh, that was my uh, short, which in the end was not that short <laughs> introduction. Fascinating. Thanks very much.
Uh, okay, let's go to Natalia. Let's see, let's see if I can keep it in three minutes. Well, no, no, no. I think we, we can stretch a few more minutes. Uh, so give much, yourself plenty of time. I think so much ground. Is this working? Working. So much ground has been covered that I don't have all that much to say. But, you know, I think amid all the doom and gloom of. Hello. Yeah. Um, the doom and gloom of the last, uh, you know, whatever, 24 hours of this conference, you know, it's really, I, I really think one of the brightest spots of um, our industry today is this like new wave of collaboration. Um, although I think journalism has always like it is by definition a very collaborative profession like we call we always collaborate with our sources we collaborate within the newsrooms, you know if in big news organizations we collaborate within the bureaus um, and so on. But I think we're at this like completely new level now. A lot of it is driven as all of you just pointed out by sheer necessity. Um, if we don't team up and if we don't stick together, we're, we're screwed. So we have to. Um, so I think it's very existential to, to collaborate, but it's also, you know, um, it also makes our journalism better. So at Coda, everything, um, we do is collaborative, really. Well, most of the things, almost everything that we do is cross-border because we're a thematic newsroom. So we're really trying to, to interrogate sort of trends and patterns and look into the roots of this global crisis that we cover. So if we're doing, you know, a story about um, the Russian foreign agents law and the influence it has around the world, we will go to Nicaragua and India and, you know, to journalists there and look at, um, you know, what what's happening in those countries. Um, um, and I mean, I can endless, endless example, similar examples of collaborations that we've done um, and continue to do all the time. So it's sort of our bread and butter. Uh, we wouldn't be able to exist without it. I think uh, it is really important to say that collaborations are incredibly difficult um, uh, because um, I think it's much easier when you are working with freelance journalists um, because we know how to do it, right? There is the background and so on. I think, Otavia, your tips and advice was great. Um, I think finding for, you know, those of you who are interested in that, from that perspective, so from editors, from someone representing a newsroom, you know, it's definitely better if some a, a project is a lot more attractive when someone comes from the start, right, mm -hmm. and offers it, pitches to you at the idea level, and you are actually invested in it, and you help the reporter shape the story. It is very rare for us to take a story when it's been done and reported and written because it, you know, it doesn't. It, uh, most of the time it doesn't work. Um, we try very hard, like so many nonprofit users, I mean, they, and uh, what Roman was just saying about the, the Spiegel, you know, it's, you know, f finding collaborations are great for audiences as well and finding audiences where um, they are. So for us, it's a really big element of collaborations as well. When we, you know, when we go to a newsroom in Nicaragua, we tap into their reporting power, but we also are making sure that the story that we publish is seen in the uh, countries that, you know, in the, by, by people who should be reading it. Um, but working with freelancers is easier, working among newsrooms is much, much harder. Um, a lot more sort of checks and balances need to be in place. It's been a real learning curve for us, we're getting better. We've done some very ambitious projects, like, you know, we um, ran this sort of um, pop-up newsroom. We call we called it we called it some name, but basically the idea we had like nine, like seven new. We got together seven newsrooms around a single story, and we kind of assigned one kind of senior reporter to it, and that reporter worked with like all seven. We did that. We did this for several stories. One of the stories was like what happened to Putin's Eurasian Union, right? And this reporter went to all the countries um, of the Eurasian Union and um, basically, and then worked with the reporters from those newsrooms. And then we all pushed it out at the same time. And, um, you know, there are organizations that are set up for that kind of work. ICFJ does a lot of it, you know, Panama Papers or CCRP does a lot of it. 
for a newsroom like ours, it worked and it had great results, but it just drained our resources. It was just too much trying to orchestrate this, you know, elaborate. And, you know, everyone is in every, every one of these newsrooms is under resourced. All journalists are underpaid. Everyone is struggling, you know, and when you add this like additional stuff to it, it really becomes difficult. One last thing I wanted to say um, is that one thing that I personally find really exciting and we haven't talked about our cross-disciplinary collaborations that I think we should all be looking into in doing more of, whether you are a freelancer or if you are a newsroom. And these are, you know, collaborations with people who have the expertise that you don't have. Um, we're doing something with a um, UK-based nonprofit now that's called um, Air Wars and they do drone warfare. So we're working on them like, on a story. And, you know, the kind of putting the, putting, you know, we're bringing the kind of the storytelling and the reporting expertise, they're bringing the data and the, the investigations that they have. And this sort of stuff is great. We've worked a lot of with artists and um, that's always been like really, really fantastic as well, because it is amazing how, you know, working like we, we did a lot of animations and it is amazing how working with artists um, on your storytelling like adds a dimension to it. And, you know, we did a big project that was actually done by um, um, the, you know, the field producer on it was Oksana Baulina who was killed in, in Kiev in the um, early days of the war. And um, it was a project on survivors of the gulags. And um, we ended up, we did lots and lots of interviews and then turned them into short films and, and worked a lot with journalists in the Baltics, um, across Russia, in, in Ukraine, on, on gathering the stories over a period of a year. But then when, we st when, we, when it came to illustrate, because we illustrated, kind of animated the backstories to them. And when we animated them, we tried to find Mm, the artists who and again it's a hassle like it's hard but I think when you try you know we try to find artists who had some sort of like personal connection either to the place or you know some personal story of the experience and I really think it added like a, just a, that extra layer of texture so I, re, um, I think being creative and sort of thinking outside of the box about collaborations and thinking like who can you actually collaborate with within the ethics and parameters. You don't want to be crossing, you know, you don't want to be, I mean, I don't know. You don't want to be collaborating with Philip Morris on a story about tobacco, obviously, but then, <laughs> <laughs> that you can be working with. So that's it. Fantastic, thank you. Well, I think that just about does it for time. Uh, any quick questions? Yes. I'm really sorry for coming late. I was watching online because I'm so interested in this topic and I would love to hear about the costs involved in this and specifically um, I'm working on a report so hopefully this is all on the record but I'd love to hear like the costs involved and what would your recommendations be to donors because this does seem to be the the future of journalism is collaborative and it's cross country. Um, so what kind of advice do you have and also like on the infrastructure, how do you even figure out the technical infrastructure, the digital security. I mean, that's a lot of questions. I guess the funding and, and the um, recommendations would be my top interest to hear from all of you on that. Okay, thanks. If you're willing to go a few more minutes, then let's do it, let's tackle that. Anybody wanna, uh, please. I think um, on the technical side of things, I think that's why it's important to work with partners that are, you know, decent partners. And if they are, then they will be on the same page with, um they'll, they'll they'll speak the language right they'll they'll know you want to have to start from from scratch um on the costs issue i mean obviously the best collaborations are the ones where you can share the costs uh between the ones between newsrooms um it's not always possible um so i think you know we we tend to go into relationships where we we feel like the investment is worth it. And if we're putting up all the money, then we're getting a lot of the, you know, we're getting, we're getting audience or we're getting impact or we're, get, we're getting something for it and it's a worthwhile investment. It really varies story by story basis. I don't think it necessarily needs to be more expensive than your 
um, I, I think producing a story as a collaboration can potentially be, especially like newsroom to newsroom collaboration can be cheaper um, than doing it. Um, you know, it's much cheaper to, it's much cheaper to find a newsroom and I don't know why I've picked on Nicaragua and now can't like, I, you know, get away from it. It's much cheaper to find a newsroom in Nicaragua. Though there are no left, but uh, used to be. Uh, and work with, like, work with a journalist um, who is there than to send someone, right? Um, it's also harder because if you're sending the person you know, like, there is a reason why people parachute um, mm -hmm. correspondents in because, you know, they land and they deliver the goods. Um, the recommendations for donors, I think, the important thing is not to force any collaborations and I don't think they should be made mandatory for like if you want to support a newsroom you shouldn't be a newsroom you know you shouldn't be forcing but but then there are there are grants like you know this one that we um because of which we are all here that you know specifically support collaborations and there you know there there are opportunities okay. I don't think I can add a lot, but uh, um, mostly about like or organizing part of the process. If it's more than two journalists or two partner centers, if it's three or more, it should be a good coordinator of the process, especially if it's like maybe it's even like technical person, administrative person from some of centers or from some of media. Uh, because it should be it should be person who uh, who set uh, deadlines and who keep uh, that the deadlines will be um, that uh, that all journalists know about them. Because if it's more than two journalists or more than two centers, it will be chaotic. So it should be great coordinator person with uh, who people who journalists will listen to. So it's very important for doing everything on uh, step by step and to to publish on time because we all we we editors all know journalists who always want to another day another week another year <laughs> we know this and that's why very important to have good coordinate about money um we always apply for some we're looking for foundation if we have like clear view of the project we want to bring with other centers and we are looking in, it depends on countries, depends on uh, salaries or honorarium in, in countries. But this is um, idea for you. If I'm not mistaken, it's uh, the grants between 10,000 uh, and uh, 20,000 euros. Between 5,000 and 50,000 euros. Uh, 50,000, yeah, because we got like 10,000, something like this for three centers. And uh, in centers like I'm from Ukraine, this is our partners from Romania and Bulgaria, for two, three months work, like partly work of journalists, like uh, part work of some administrators, it's enough like for two, three months. If it's longer project, we need more money. It, or if it's something complicated, like we need to create databases or create like special lending or this type, it's like, um, it's much more expensive. We're talking about, we're talking about investigative like classical uh, story uh, on website or sometimes it's video pieces. Yeah, it's enough. Uh, so the short advice for uh, the donors is trust the newsrooms, because sometimes donors ask, you know, for some specific description of the project, please give us the project's uh, environmental investigation about, I don't know, CO2. And, uh, you know, sometimes things change, like the war starts and you realize that nobody's interested in, you know, in climate change anymore. And uh, there is things that are more important and you would rather, as an editor, spend your money on writing something about what's going on in Bucha. Uh, or sometimes, you know, we just don't get enough data. It's also possible, you know, you apply for a grant, then you just realize that there is no story over there. And it's not because you did a bad job, actually you did a good job in realizing that there is no yeah. uh, story there. Uh, and sometimes it's difficult to talk to donors and tell them, look, I mean, you know, we, this was our hypothesis, it didn't work. So let's, let's change it. Let's, let's do something. Uh, better and uh, not all the donors understand it so you know they sometimes are too rigid in uh, in the way they form the budgets and their reports like if you applied for an environmental project please do write about uh, climate change which is that is why all the reporters all the newsrooms are always saying please trust us and you know we know better what we gotta do now because we know our audience uh in terms of um 
Anna made a very important point about uh, people who manage projects. Really, all the best uh, cross-border investigations were managed by great people. Like, you know, Panama Papers was managed by Marina Walker, a worker for, uh, from, uh, from ICAJ. Now she works for uh, in the Pulse Center, um, Marina Walker. And, uh, you know, other projects as well, the, the success is really dependent on uh, the manager. Uh, in terms of technical uh, platforms, there are lots of them these days. Some are open source, others are, uh, you know, are, are developed by organizations like OCCRP or ICAJ. But basically, all all of them are really similar. So what you need, you know, are three key things. If there is a lot of data, you need a kind of platform that allows you to index data and uh, search it. Uh, so I know that ICAJ uses its own tool, uh, others use other tools, but there are some, a couple of open source tools. I don't remember the names, but I can uh, check them and maybe share it later. Uh, then the second uh, thing that you need is kind of platform that allows you to discuss the project uh, and share all the data. And again, there are plenty of different tools. And the third thing that you need is secure communication. And in the majority of cases, people use Signal or other uh, open source uh, apps. So these are three keystones, uh, you know, uh, basic keystones that you need for successful collaboration. Any more questions? Hi, thank you so much for speaking. Really enjoyed hearing from all of you. Uh, my question, going back to your point, Natalia, about wanting reporters to come to you early with a pitch, um, you know, when you're at the beginning of a big story that you think could be something large and cross-border, I'm thinking about your story about the um, migration uh, kind of corruption in the criminal justice system there. As a reporter, how much do you need to have to feel comfortable and like you have enough to go to an editor? And then as an editor, for the others on the panel, how much do you want to see from a reporter when they're coming to you to try to pitch a story like this? Where is the bar of you want them to come in early, but they need to have enough to be able to tell you there's a good story? How much do you want to see when you're, you're seeing a pitch and how much do you need to feel comfortable? Yeah, I think. You know, I think you want to see that the story is viable, basically, mm -hmm. and it's there is enough there that's worth digging into more and looking into more. Um, and um, there is always. There is always like if the pitches, if they, if they, if they, what we want, what what is important is that you come with a pitch rather than a vague idea. You know, there are a lot of people who come with sort of, you know, I would love to do a story on um, mistreatment of migrants in Italy. Like that's not a story. That's <laughs> that's an idea. That's like a topic. Like it's not. And uh, many journalists, especially young journalists, make make that mistake of coming to you with a with a with an idea rather than a pitch. It has to be a pitch. You have to do the legwork ahead of the time. And then you know, if you see that if you're getting that clear pitch, um, that is worth like building, investing into, and looking into, and so on. Then you're willing I mean we all commission stories knowing that it might not work out yeah. and we might have to get it killed and you know the reporter will be paid the kill fee and all of that will happen like there is a system in place for that but the most important thing is that you should you should know what the story is what the story is that you want to tell you should be open to changing the it if you know it, reporting process requires it and you should have some idea about kind of the characters and scenes and setting that it will involve at least for us um you know i mean there are other publications that don't necessarily require that so i would say that's the most important thing so like really honing your pitching skills is like really really important but that absolutely question do you yes think? do you guys have any advice yeah um yeah <laughs> i mean it's it's a huge dilemma for me uh, it's been and for every freelancer um uh, i think but but i do think that uh you have to do the work before um you have to spend time and uh, resources that hopefully are going to get paid afterwards 
to really kind of like narrow your angle as much as possible yeah. and, and make sure that, and possibly if it's an ambitious project, try, it's really difficult if you don't have relationships with your editors yet, but like try to get them on the phone, which is hard. It's really tough. But if your pitch is good enough, like for example, for the new humanitarian, we had a very tough meeting at first and he was like, are you sure this is gonna be a story? And we were like, yes. And we kind of like presented him with uh, some preliminary findings. So, yeah. I would say, I, I, was, I would also, also, another advice would be build relationships with the yeah. editors, you know, even before you're pitching to them, just try to meet people, try to understand how they're thinking and then like have them, have have access to them to run ideas past them and that's okay it's when it's when you're presenting something as a pitch and it really is just an idea you know I I spend a lot of time in television and you know in tv like you basically like in especially in television news and this is like the extreme of the discipline you don't go out in the morning if you don't know what the structure of the piece is that you're filming and I've worked with cameraman when you ask them you say can you could you get that shot he would turn to him this is a very arrogant also an amazing and very experienced cameraman he would turn to me and say where does it go in your piece and if I couldn't tell him where it went he wouldn't film it you know and this is extreme but this is the kind of discipline that you should cultivate within yourself of like really structuring the story in your head and being flexible enough to be able to change it as it develops, but like really be very, very rigorous and be your own editor before you take it out into the world. Could I just add something really quickly? Another little plug. In a few weeks, uh, we will be holding uh, what we were calling a cross-border masterclass, uh, which is tackling exactly this kind of thing, how to refine your idea how to present it in the best possible way, how to apply for these kinds of grants. Uh, so you might want to join that. So I would recommend that anybody uh, go to the website ij4eu.net, sign up to the newsletter, and you'll see all the information there on upcoming events such as that. But we're very aware that this kind of um, story pitching and idea creation and presenting what is new and what, what is going to resonate, what's going to grab an editor's attention, is a skill that's acquired over many years. It's not obvious to everybody. So we're trying to provide these kinds of trainings, which are pretty useful. Hi, right. any more questions or shall we stop there? Yeah, so in our newsroom, we have, uh, we distinguish, we have three stages of, uh, of, each story has three stages. Stage one is idea. And, uh, you know, absolutely, you gotta understand the difference between the idea and the pitch. We don't, we don't call it pitch, we call it minimum story. This is the second stage. So ideally when you pitch, you gotta have the minimum story. So you gotta understand, even if you get nothing from further investigation, this is the minimum that you have on this stage, and this is the minimum that you can do and you can publish. Uh, I mean, the time frame, of course, depends. You can publish the, your minimum tomorrow, or you can publish it in a week, it depends. But still, you gotta really understand that you know, sometimes a step between uh, between the idea and the minimum story is really long. It's really difficult. But you need to understand that you know that uh, that you need to, to make this step, and you need to understand what is behind this step. Mm -hmm. And then the third stage is uh, you know the maximum that you can get. Uh, and in the majority of cases, you don't know about the maximum uh, when you pitch. You just say this would be ideal, right? If we if we can prove it, this would be like the biggest story we can get from from this idea. Uh, and of course, uh, you always gonna tend to achieve maximum. But as an editor, I I always expect my reporters pitch minimum stories so that I understand okay, this is what I will get for sure. So internally for us, it's very similar as well, because internally a lot of ideas are discussed all the time. But if you are pitching as a freelancer to the editor, you don't have the luxury of kind of like, oh, you know, I heard this thing. And like, what do you guys think? <laughs> so you need to like, you need to go with more of them that minimum story that Roman is talking about. But it, it, it's nothing bad to kind of not to pitch, but talk about ideas. Because sometimes reporters need advice. You know, this is my idea. How do I make a story from the idea? So nothing bad. 
because I, I see that sometimes reporters are afraid to pitch their ideas. They uh, they think that it's better. To, I mean, of course, it's better to find a minimum story. But I mean, if you struggle finding uh, the minimum, then nothing is bad to say, hey, look, this is my idea. What do you think? What minimum story we can do from it? But yeah, but I, I mean, I get a lot of pitches and if people are sending me ideas, I just don't have the time to be discussing them. That's another problem. Sometimes you don't have time. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much to Roman, to Anna, to Natalia, and to Octavia. Really, really fascinating stuff. I'll just remind you of that website again, ij4eu.net.